All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm the CTO of SkedgeMe, and we're an enterprise scheduling software company. We make uh, a number of software components that enable our clients to book appointments and group events with their customers. Uh, we handle everything from the front end, which presents a branded customer experience, including a web page that can be integrated easily into our clients' existing websites, as well as emails, uh, a back-end system that handles all of their business logic, uh, a front-end for their staff to use, uh, and we integrate into their own back-end systems. If they have existing HR systems or payroll, uh, we can integrate into that as well. We have clients across a wide variety of industries, including retail, uh, education, government, uh, you name it. This is an example of one of our deployments. Uh, this is on the Sephora website from a couple of hours ago. Um, if you want to sign up to have them put your makeup on for you, I'm sure we've got a lot of takers here for that, um, you can go on their website and you'll see this. And this is a live uh, representation of their availability at a particular location. Uh, it takes into account all of their staff schedules. Uh, and so this can actually make uh, an ironclad commitment to you that there's going to be someone there to put your makeup on at a particular time. Now, this is actually the Sephora website. This part, surrounded in blue, is the SketchMe component. And that's running on our servers. It's actually embedded in an iframe. So you can see that we're pretty serious about getting the branding correct. Now, when I walked in the door about a year and a half ago at SketchMe, we had a really big problem. We had our developers spending about three quarters of their time fixing bugs and only about a quarter of their time actually implementing the software. Um, this was in part due to the fact that it was a massive code base built in Groovy on Grails. Now, say what you will about that choice, uh, the software itself was not built that well either. Um, you know, there were major bugs in every system. Uh, one of the biggest ones that really impacted our clients was that sometimes we would double book people. And if you show up, uh, and we've made a commitment to you on behalf of our client that there's someone, someone who's going to be there and there isn't anyone there, that's a really big problem for us. That makes our client look, look bad, and that's not something we can't do. Uh, we also had really bad performance uh, in a number of places in the app. Things that were supposed to be interactive would take upwards of a minute to load. Uh, and finally, we didn't have the ability to actually create solutions that directly matched our, our client's needs. Uh, we were forced very frequently into a situation where we either had to tell our clients, you know, maybe you should adjust your business model a little bit to, to fit with our product, or, <laughs> you know, or we can spend a lot of time and effort um, and end up with a less maintainable product because we've put their particular business logic throughout our system. So either way, that's a really terrible situation for us to be in. So after a lot of thought and, you know, rereading Joel Spulski's article on the demise of Netscape, we decided that we needed to rewrite it. <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you have heard of my background. I did some Haskell before. Uh, and eventually, we decided that Haskell was the right way to go. Now, I hadn't written a website in Haskell. So that was a little bit new to me, although I did have some, some other Haskell experience. So one thing that I knew Haskell was really going to knock out of the park was our basic architecture. Monads are a great abstraction for dividing your software into layers. Like every Haskell application, we start at the IO layer. But IO really doesn't give you much. It's just like any imperative language, and you can do anything at any time. You can't really reason about what an IO action does. So the first thing that we did is we built a raw DB layer on top of the IO layer. And what this does is gives us a SQL interface to the database. It guarantees that we're going to abide by everything that's necessary to maintain ACID uh, guarantees between transactions. And one really important thing is that it prevents us from doing any side effects during a transaction. And this is really important because if a transaction gets rolled back, but you've already sent an email, and this is a kind of bug that we had on the old platform, you can't take that email back, and that's a big problem. You know, that, that event may not actually exist. 
Uh, and also, we're using optimistic locking at the database layer, so we need to be able to support retries. Uh, so we don't obviously want to be sending the same email three times, even if the uh, transaction does eventually go through. So the raw DB layer gives us basically a guarantee that our system is going to have the kind of concurrency guarantees that we want to have uh, in our cluster. Now, that doesn't make it very easy for us to actually program because we still have to write SQL directly. So on top of that, we built another monad, the DB monad. And that gives us an IOREF-like interface to the database and lets us just sort of, you know, use any Haskell ADTs that we want to use. It also adds caching and a little bit of validation that we weren't able to express in terms of SQL constraints. On top of that, we have another monad, uh, which is our security monad, which introduces a notion of who is actually performing the action. The DB layer guarantees that we're not going to mess up our data, but the security monad uh, is necessary to make sure that even if a transformation is legal, it's actually legal for this person to do it. On top of that, we finally have our top level abstraction, which is our business logic layer. And that layer enforces things like making sure we don't double book people, making sure that staff are only booked with rooms that are close enough to their office, things like that. Um, and that's where we have most of the variation between our clients. So this worked really well. And another thing that worked really well for us was breaking down the system into a variety of uh, components. This is something you'd do pretty much anywhere, and Haskell made it pretty easy for us. So we have general purpose components, which are you know, appointments, people, things like that. And we also sometimes have to write components that are specific to a particular client. Uh, maybe a custom way of reporting, maybe an integration with an in-house back-end system, you name it. Now, each of these components may actually cut through our stack. So appointments, in order to look up the appointments in a particular range of time, we actually use uh, a spatial index in the database. Now, our DB layer isn't, doesn't have an abstraction for that, so we actually write that right at the raw DB layer. But most of our stuff, we try to keep as high in the stack as we can. So each of the filled-in boxes here represents a Haskell module in our code base, and this has worked pretty well for us. Now, one thing that I was a little bit less sure was going to work well in Haskell uh, was the way that we actually implement our security policies. So like most websites, we've got roles, and those roles basically determine what a user can do. But unlike a lot of websites, we don't have the luxury of cramming our customers into a particular set of roles that we've set up. We've got clients with varying kinds of organizational structures, so we frequently find ourselves needing to implement custom security policies just for a particular client. And we wanted to be able to do this in a way that didn't involve going throughout our code base and adding checks here and there. Um, now, in an object-oriented language, you might approach this by, for example, using an inheritance hierarchy where you start with some basic roles uh, and then you customize them for each customer. But we have another complication, which is the customer-specific sp components. Uh, as far as the security system is concerned, each component has its own set of verbs, and they only make sense within that component. Now, obviously for appointments, you know, that includes booking and joining appointments and canceling them and things like that. But also, each of our customer-specific components has its own verbs associated with it. So we need to be able to handle that as well. And a straightforward inheritance hierarchy would not handle this very well. But Haskell gives us a tool that really makes this quite easy. Uh, we use a multi-parameter type class, and so now we can do double dispatch on the type of the role and the type of the verb. So we basically have one type that represents each role schema, one for our default one and one for each of the clients who has a custom one. And then we also have a type for the verbs within each component of our system. Now, it's very easy for us to write this. This is a simple uh, example if you have a client who has uh, a, like a retailer who has district managers and local managers and that kind of thing, then you know their leadership can do anything, and the next you know the district managers can run any report within their district. Store managers can run the store report, and nobody else can run anything else. So it's a very easy declarative thing. I mean, all, all it's doing is returning a bool and throwing an exception if it's false. No big deal. 
But the really nice thing about this is that Haskell will check for us that we're implementing everything that's actually used in our system. So we don't need to write instances of policy for you know, Acme U roles uh, against the by and large reports. So this is an example of what our actual instance implementation chart might look like with the green ones being instances that exist and the other ones don't exist. And this is pretty good. This is nice because it's statically checked. We know that we've written everything. We know when we're done. We don't have to go back and forth with the client. We don't have to go back and forth with QA. It's just a list of compiler errors. Um, but we can actually do better than this. And the type class system makes that very easy as well. Because a lot of the time, these green boxes on the left here you know, a particular client probably has particular security requirements for their custom modules, but they usually don't with respect to our general purpose modules. So the way we can do this is we can just delegate our security policy uh, by translating their roles into standard roles. So, for example, if by and large doesn't really have anything special with regard to appointment scheduling, then we can just map their leadership onto a standard admin their district manager onto a standard staff, et cetera. And we can do this on a component by component basis. So where they do have custom work, we implement it. Where they don't, we very easily avoid implementing it. All of this is statically checked. All of this is easy for our programmers to deal with. And it's all pretty easy to read, which is really important for security code. So this is what it might end up looking like, where the, the ones that are grayed out are just delegated to something else. Now, this is a great example of how Haskell lets you build code that's going to be good for the long run. This is code that I think we're going to be able to keep using very flexibly, uh, not with just the clients we've already rolled out, but as we roll out the rest of our clients and continue to grow as a business. Um, but sometimes you need to write really quick and dirty code, and you don't really care about the longevity, and you don't really have a whole lot of engineering constraints. And this was the case for our importer. We have an old legacy system, and as quickly as possible, we need to get all of our clients transitioned to the new system. We've already started this process, and our importer is some of the worst Haskell code I've ever seen. <laughs> I've written a good part of it. The people on my team have written a good part of it. None of us understands how it works. <laughs> but that's OK, because it only needs to work for the clients that we actually have and the features that they actually use we can test it on each input data set very easily. When we're running it, it's not going to be in production on some server somewhere being used by a client. There's going to be a developer sitting there actually watching the migration process and making sure it goes well. And we really don't care about maintaining this because we're going to throw it away in a couple of months. So we don't want to spend any extra effort on it. So we ended up with 1,400 lines of Haskell. And if you look at our git commit log, it's almost entirely additions. We really spent no time refactoring it. There's, there was no effort put in up front to try to structure it. Uh, this is really pretty bad code. I, I, there's no other way to say it. Um, and you know, almost every function in the importer is partial, heavily partial. And nobody really knows where the limits are. Um, and Here's an example of one of our type signatures. <laughs> I guess it has about two dozen parameters. Um, I haven't counted. But you know, this, is, this is ridiculous. Obviously, nobody understands what the point of this function is. But it does import a service. And it works. <laughs> now, oftentimes, when people have to write quick and dirty scripts. They look to dynamically typed languages. They look to languages that have a lot less enforcement. They don't have a compiler. And they say, OK, I'm just going to dash this out in you know, bash or awk or set or whatever. Um, and there are certainly times when that can be the best way to achieve things. But for this particular case, we found ourselves leaning on the type system of Haskell so heavily that you know, I've spoken to everybody on my team, and we all agree that we could not have done this as badly as we did without the type system. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a great example of how, you know, I wasn't sure how Haskell would handle this, but I've actually learned how to write code 
quicker and, and worse than I ever thought imaginable, <laughs> thanks to Haskell. <laughs> All right. So what's better than writing code quick and dirty? Not writing it at all. And this is an area where people often sort of criticize Haskell. They say there aren't that many libraries for Haskell uh, compared with maybe you know, anything on JVM or JavaScript, et cetera. And that's true. If you look on Hackage and you compare against NPM or, or any of the major repos for really popular languages, there are a lot less packages. Nothing you can do about that. But what really surprised me is that the amount of actual use we've gotten out of Hackage packages is about an order of magnitude higher than we have in JavaScript, which is what our front end is built in. Um, and that compares favorably with the old uh, Groovy-based backend as well. Those both have about a dozen libraries that they can actively use. And this is despite spending a lot of time trying to figure out what the good libraries are, find the right ones, integrate them. And the, the issue is just that in these other languages, it's much harder to find a library that actually works to solve your problem. Um, in JavaScript, we've had nine libraries that we still have integrated. They're good. We use them although some of them have bugs that we work around. In Haskell, we use 70 libraries, and we've only had to replace one due to bugs in that library. Um, it's partially because it's easier to find uh, libraries in Haskell. We can search by type using Google. Um, we can look on Hackage. It's very pretty well organized. Um, and it's partially because we can easily vet libraries. You know, we can look at the type signature of everything and say, hey, you know, this is all pure functions. It's probably not going to screw anything up too badly. Um, whereas in JavaScript, you know, we'll integrate something after having even written tests to try to figure out whether it's good enough. And then when we get it into QA, we find all kinds of issues and it's messing up our DOM. And, you know, we, we basically have no choice but to rip it out and replace it with a different one or write our own. And so the time spent on that combined with the overall average package quality which obviously, you know, in a small academic community like Haskell tends to be higher, um, means that despite the fact that Haskell has a smaller absolute number of libraries, the number of useful libraries seems to be a lot higher. So there were a few things that weren't great that probably would have been better in a different language. Um, one issue is that we built uh, our components and they ended up with some cyclic dependencies due to basically how our database was structured. Um, that's something that with GHC is really not that easy to deal with. The HS boot uh, implementation is fairly incomplete. And so I would, I guess, recommend uh, not using cyclic modules, even if that means you just have to dump things into a single file and delimit with comments or something. Um, Scalability beyond four cores was problematic. Now, I'm told that this is probably going to improve drastically in 7.8, uh, and I look forward to testing that. But this also wasn't that big of a problem for us because really, if you're running a cloud-based application, you don't want to be scaling on really huge machines. You want to scale on whatever the cheapest machine that provides good latency is. And for us, two to four cores is perfectly sufficient. Um, Another issue that we ran into that was just a little weird, and it took us a while to track down, so I thought I'd bring it up, is that when we had the idle garbage collector enabled, which is enabled by default, it would cause fairly long pauses. And we achieved much better performance and average latency by simply turning that off. Now, that depends a lot on your workload and how much you've got in your residence set, uh, but we didn't see any problems with turning it off uh, for this kind of uh, server-based workload. Um, and finally, when you do run into issues in Haskell in production, which is a lot less common than in other languages in my experience, but still, sometimes you run into them, Haskell by default doesn't give you stack traces. And the logging facilities are not as well built out as with other languages. So in many cases, uh, we would need to, for example, run using profiling in production. Now luckily, it's pretty fast, so it doesn't really cause a big problem, but it does make builds take longer. It does complicate the tool chain a little bit. Um, and it's something that you might not think to do before you first put your application into production. 
So uh, these are the main issues that we had. I, I would say overall they didn't really factor in to the success of the project. They were all pretty small. Uh, but a few things uh, that, that we did run into. All right, so where we stand today after uh, spending about 10 months uh, rewriting our entire application, uh, we went from 43,000 lines of Groovy to 8,200 lines of Haskell. All of our major bugs are gone. Um, we do have bugs, of course, from time to time, but once we get rid of them, they tend to stay gone, uh, which is a big difference. We don't spend any appreciable percentage of our time fixing bugs. Um, the performance is vastly improved. Uh, we get about the same performance on a single core with uh, our Haskell implementation as we did on a 64 core machine for the same operation in Groovy. Admittedly, that's not entirely Groovy's fault. Um, and the flexibility is greatly increased because we applied the same kind of methodology uh, all over our system as we did to the security system. Um, uh, we currently have moved over about a half of our client base and we've had great success with them so far. It's in use by thousands of people. Uh, Sephora is one of the examples. Um, and we look forward to moving everybody else over because it's been pretty great so far. All right, any questions? Well, uh, we do do some testing with Quick Check. We have not found that it's, like, we've tested mostly some of our critical components. We have, for example, a data structure that represents a mapping from time to events that's fairly efficient for that kind of thing. So we tested that pretty heavily. Um, but overall, we've found that just putting together Haskell in the most obvious way leads to better, uh, leads to better results than we were getting on our old platform. So you know, we are building automated tests. In fact, our QA guys, who are previously non-programmers, are writing all of their unit tests in Haskell because it was easier than JavaScript to pick up. Um, if you look at the web driver interfaces for that, uh, for the Selenium-based web testing framework, you'll actually see it's, it's quite obviously easier to write in Haskell. Um, and yeah, so I, the, does that cover it? <laughs> all right. <laughs> much, much more horribly. <laughs> more horribly, but it still works. <laughs> Let's talk afterwards. <laughs>